Welcome back to Board Online, Board Offline. Today we have the second and final part in our Tales from the Loop, the board game instructional series. We're going to cover all the remaining rules you need to know to be able to play this game. Every round, the first thing that happens is the school phase. The first step in the school phase is the preparation step. Players should check the diary card at the start of the round, or diary cards if there is multiple. The first player should read the diary card out loud so that all players understand what they need to do or what might happen during this round. For instance, with erratic behavior, there's some flavor text here and then some instructions here. And ultimately, what players are trying to do is spend two time when nearby a machine to flip this card, specifically when next to the par hoofer. Then players will need to replenish the time for their kids. All the time cubes in the kids' action space goes back into their pool. Keep in mind that if the kids have a condition, then their time cube there is locked. The next thing to do during the preparation step is prepare for rumors. All currently remaining rumors on the board are then slid to the right to make room for new rumors. Players will draw a new chore the same way as before. Draw two and then pick one. The next step of the school phase is the school day. On any weekday, the kids have to go to school before starting their adventures. So place all kids at the school at location M. The first player then draws a school card. In every round other than the first round, new rumors are drawn at this time based on this icon in the top left corner of the school card. This icon indicates to draw a number of rumors equal to the number of kids. This icon means the number of kids minus two, but always a minimum of one. And this number means the number of kids minus one, always a minimum of one. So in this case, if we're playing with two players and it says the number of kids minus one, then we would only draw a single rumor meaning there is room on the track. However, if it had been this icon, meaning two rumors need to be drawn, then this one would come out, and now there's not enough room on the track since there's already four cards on the track, which means this rumor card gets bumped off the track. And then these would slide down, and this rumor would come out. Anytime a rumor card is bumped off the track, Enigma increases by two. It should also be noted in a five player game, this symbol mean, it should also be noted that four is the maximum number of rumor cards that can be drawn since there's only four spaces on the track. So in a five player game, this symbol still only causes four to be drawn. The weekend is a special round where each kid receives three bonus time to use for that round only. Also, the kids will start the weekend at their homes, as listed on their character boards, instead of the school. If at the beginning of a round a kid has no time in their pool due to being grounded and conditions, they do not participate in the school phase. If they were going to be the first player, that would instead be passed to the next player in turn order. They cannot spend any time or move away from their home in any way. If other kids happen to come to their location, they can help those kids just as they would normally. By giving up this round, kids on sick leave get a free rest action, which as you can see, relieves one condition once per round. And they are automatically home for dinner, which raises the favor of their parents by one, and therefore removes grounded. And so now they have freed up three time tokens. The next round, the kid will return to play as normal. When placing out rumors, if a duplicate rumor shows up, as you see here, H and H, discard it. If a, another rumor shows up as a duplicate, so two or more, then not only do you discard it and then continue drawing, but all the machines will be set to alert for the entire rest of this round. After getting the rumor track 
squared away, players will now deal with the school event, and the first player is the focus of the school event. This test is always mandatory unless it uses the word may. This icon means it's a group event, so the first player will roll and they can receive help. This icon means only the first player may take part in this event. They cannot receive any help. And this icon means it is an individual event that affects all players, so each player rolls individually and no players can help any other players. Once the school event has been dealt with, it's time to see to the machines for the current round. First, check for a firmware upgrade. If the current school card has this firmware icon and the previous one does as well, then a firmware upgrade occurs. Any machines that have been hacked would reset and would no longer be considered hacked. To reset the machine, follow the following procedures. This is also what you would do if a machine had been wrecked in the previous round. First, remove any firewalls. Place the machine on its starting sector. Set the machine's response card to either routine or alert based on the rules we discussed in the previous video. If the starting sector were occupied by another machine, remember that two machines can never occupy the same sector, so instead this machine will be placed in an adjacent sector either here or here. After any resets have been resolved, players will now resolve machine movement. Players check the lower part of the school card to see what the machines will do. In this case, the worker will do nothing and the guardian will move over one and then down one. Keep in mind that two machines, as we mentioned, can never be in the same sector. So if this card would have that happen, in this case, the guardian move here and then here, instead the guardian will stop short. It will move as far as it can and then stop there rather than moving into the same sector as another machine. However, machines can move through other machine sectors, so it could move here and then here. These movement instructions are always resolved from left to right. If two machines on the board have the same icon as you see here, alerted machines will move first. So this one would move here, but it can't move down obviously because this one's in the way. And then routine machines would move. After movement, each machine updates their response card according to the sector they are now in. So this machine would now go to routine and this machine would also stay at routine. If this one were one sector over, it would now no longer be intersecting with a white location and it would become alert. Also, just for clarification, if a machine were in a sector like this where it's near both orange and white, it would be set to routine. If a machine has a hack token on it from a previously failed hack attempt, then keep the response card with the alert side facing up and instead remove the token. This machine will not adjust its response card again until the next round. During the adventure phase, the kids will use their time to move around the island and solve various mysteries. This is going to be done by performing actions. It's important throughout the adventure phase that the first player keeps an eye on any requirements on the diary card. So if they are met, the necessary resolution can occur. Taking an action always means spending time. Taking an action always requires the player to spend time. Unless otherwise indicated, an action always costs one time, and when the time is spent, it's placed in this section. The basic resolution mechanic is called a test or a roll. And to take a test or a roll, the player will make a pool of three dice. If using the kid's strength, let's say they were using Brave, then five dice would be used for a two to three player game, or if it was a four to five player game, four dice would be used. If the test is against the kid's weakness, then only two dice are used in a two to three player game, or one in a four to five player game. If there is one or more kids at the same location as the kid taking the test, those kids can help. A maximum of two kids can help taking a test. And for each kid that helps, an additional die will be rolled. 
kids cannot help if the test matches their weakness, which means Sasha can help with any test other than the one with this symbol because he has the dull trait. However, even if kids do help, the success text of the test is specifically for the kid taking the test, unless otherwise specified, of course. Items of the same color as the test also add one die to the test. This does mean that the black items do not assist with any test. Kids are allowed to use several of their items as long as they match the test to gain more dice. But only items used by the kid currently making the roll can be used. So even if Sasha, who's helping Nils, had an item that matched the color, that would not do any good for this test. This does not spend the item. They're not discarded when used this way. Items may also be combined to create combos. Combos are listed on the item here at the bottom. And we'll talk about combos a little bit later in this video. So once you have created your dice pool, which is determined by the trade associated with the test, the bonuses from kids helping, and the use of item cards. So now you create your dice pool, which is determined, as we've mentioned, by the trade associated with the test, bonuses from kids helping, and the use of item cards. We actually have seven dice here. The maximum number of dice possible in the pool is eight, and the minimum is one. Whenever there are modifications to the dice pool through effects or anything else in the game, they always refer to the number of dice being rolled, not the number you have to roll, because the number you have to roll is always six. If any of the dice come up six, as you see here, we've got two sixes, then you have succeeded at the roll. If you did not roll any sixes, then you have failed. However, failed rolls can be pushed, which we'll discuss momentarily. Keep in mind this chart on the player aid helps you keep straight all the different modifications to the dice pool. Also, on page 14, there's this chart that shows you your chances of success based off the number of dice in the pool. Anomaly cards are artifacts with connections to the loop. When gaining an anomaly, take as many counters as the card has uses, in this case, three and place these counters on the card. An anomaly has two functions. Sometimes it will have a actual combo tag, as you see here, knockout, that can be used completely on its own, but many of them will have a regular tag that can be combined with something else to create a combo. It also has a special effect down here that is unique to this card. If the effect is an action or replaces an action, it still costs one time to use. When using the card for either of the functions I just mentioned, the combo tag or this special ability, you remove one of the counters from the anomaly. Once the anomaly has no more counters, it is immediately discarded. At times, there is a way to completely avoid rolling dice and instead produce an automatic success. This is where combos come in. Several cards and effects have a combo option. So for instance here, Boombox and Lowrider Bike. As you can see, when the Boombox combines with a bike, you get the decoy combo. This is a bike as indicated by that tag here. And you can see here, this is loud on the bike, loud and decoy. So these combine to make the decoy combo. If Nils was taking the feeding grounds test, and it has the decoy tag here, as you can see, that means that these two items combined create an automatic success with this test. Items used in this way to create a combo are discarded, except if it's the iconic item for that character. So the lowrider bike would stay, but the boombox would be discarded. If the combo came from a hacked machine, that combo does not deplete in any way when used. Sometimes the tags for individual items may be found on certain actions. This is still considered a combo when used this way. And the card would still be discarded unless it was an iconic item. And just to reiterate, anomalies sometimes by themselves will have the combo. Here's decoy here. So if the player were in possession of the bison boars, then they could use it to automatically succeed at feeding grounds. However, keep in mind that anomalies do not automatically discard when used this way. Instead, their number of uses depletes by one. Finally, the tag 
knowledge is a wild tag and can be used to replace any other tag. If a test does not succeed on the first roll, the player can choose to take a condition to re-roll all the dice in the test. This is called pushing a roll. The kid takes unspent time from their pool and places it in the condition of their choice. If there is no time in the pool or if the kid is injured, then they cannot push. A roll can only be pushed once and the re-roll is not counted as a separate roll from the original roll, but instead completely replaces it. If a kid fails a test, any kids who helped in that test are bound by the failure result as well. If the failure requires the kid to take a condition, the helping kids also take that condition. Sometimes if a failure result lists a specific condition, it may have a parenthetical that lists a different condition as well. The condition in the parentheses is for the helping kids. Any other failure text, though, is applied only to the kid taking the test, unless it's specified otherwise on the card. So let's talk about these conditions a little bit more. Kids become hurt in game conditions by failing rolls or by pushing. When a kid is required by the rules of a card's text to take a specific condition, move one time from their pool to that condition. If that slot already contains time or if the text does not specify a condition type, the kid must instead place time in the slot of a more severe condition than the most severe one already locked. The order of severity is as listed here, exhausted, upset, scared, and injured. So for instance, if a failure condition said the kid gets upset, but upset is already locked, then the kid instead will become scared. They cannot choose exhausted because they must go with the next highest condition. The same would be true if the failure text did not specify which condition. In that case, they also must become scared. Time placed in a condition slot is locked and cannot be used for other actions until relieved. This can be done by taking the rest action, as listed here, or taking steps stated for three of the conditions, upset, scared, and injured. Each of those has a way to get rid of them listed right next to it. If a kid needs to gain a condition, but all of their time cubes are in the action space, they take one from there and place it in the necessary condition. When a kid is upset, they can relieve this by getting help. When they're scared, they can relieve that by succeeding. It's important to realize that a push is not a new role. So if a kid were to gain upset or scared in order to push, they could not then relieve that same condition with the push roll. Exhausted has no effect other than to lock a time cube. Upset also causes the character to not be able to help. Scared causes the character to not be able to use their strength. Injured gives the character minus two on all rolls. Exhausted is relieved through the rest action. Upset is relieved when a player gets help from another character and scared is relieved by succeeding on a test. Injured is a little bit different. At each end phase, the cube will move one step to the right. When it is moved from this final square, it is placed back into the action space. Players may also use the rest action to move a injured cube one space to the right, speeding up recovery. If an injured kid becomes injured again, the cube is pushed back to the beginning. Now let's discuss the various movement actions a character can take. Walking costs one time and allows the player to move from their current location to an adjacent one. However, if a character is moving from an open location to a restricted location, that will cost two time. The bus ride action allows the player to move from any bus stop to any other bus stop for one time. During a bus ride, kids will only have to avoid machines nearby the destination location. If a kid is in good favor with their parents, meaning that the favor token is on the smiley face, then they can ask for a car ride. To take a car ride, the player will move the favor token from the smiley face to this face here, and then their parents will drop them off at their chosen open location. In addition to reducing favor, this also costs one time. 
When a kid controls a machine after a successful hack, they can use it to take a machine write action for one time. First, put the machine on a sector nearby their current location, then move along the grid according to the movement value on the machine sheet. As you can see, the fire guard has two movement. And so they could move it maybe here. The move must end nearby another location, in this case, nearby this location and this location, and it can pass other machines on the way. It can even land on other machines because upon reaching the final sector, the machine and all of the kids are moved into the location. Remember that the machine's capacity value or transport value shows how many kids it can transport. So Sasha could have come along for the ride if he'd wanted to. Keep in mind that only the hacker controlling the machine has to spend time to make the move, but all participating kids have to be at the same location. And the kids that come along for the ride can only move to the same location as the hacker and the machine, meaning they can't jump off the machine along the way. So for instance, since it moved from here to here, Sasha couldn't have jumped off here to go to this location. We've briefly mentioned avoiding machines, so let's talk about that in a little bit more detail now. When entering a location nearby a machine, as you can see, this location is nearby this machine, check its response card to see if a test is required to avoid it. So for this machine, the avoid says a green check mark. The green check mark means no test is required. However, if this yellow special icon is under the avoid, or this red block icon, then a test will be required using the listed trait. So for instance, in this case, either of these traits. A successful roll means that the kid has avoided the attention of the machine and does not trigger any effects and can continue moving. A failed test, on the other hand, triggers the machine's response. Often this will hinder movement. This test does not add any time cost to move and it can be pushed like a normal test. If there is a block symbol for the test the kid fails, then not only do they suffer whatever the failure text says, but they also must move back to the location they came from. If the kid had gotten a car ride or used a bus to get to the location they're at, then they don't go back to the original location, but they do go back to an adjacent location. For one time, a kid can scout either a face down rumor or a machine at a nearby sector. If they scout a rumor, the token is flipped face up to indicate it's been scouted and the rumor card itself is turned face up. If a machine is scouted, the kid gets to place the two leftmost firewalls, and in this case, that means all of the firewalls, face up in their spots. These firewalls are drawn randomly from the bowl or from the pile. For one time, a kid may investigate a rumor by performing the test on that rumor card. They must be at the same location as that rumor. Kids are allowed to investigate rumors that are face down, in which case they will flip it face up, and then regardless of what the test is, they must take it. Remember, if a kid successfully investigates a rumor that is part of this scenario's rumor set, insight is raised by one. Also remember, if when investigating they fail the test, regardless of what the rumor set is, enigma is raised by one. After successfully completing a rumor card, all kids at that same location may participate in a free trade action to distribute any new cards as well as cards already owned. And speaking of trade, kids may initiate a trade for one time. Only one kid has to pay the time, but all kids there can freely trade any number of items or anomalies except for iconic items. Kids can even exceed their item limit of four cards this way, but during the end phase, they will have to discard back down to four. Kids can hack machines to take control of them, and this is done generally as a group action. Each participating kid must be in a location nearby to that machine, and they must spend at least one time. The combined starting cost for initiating a hack, though, is the number of firewall spaces on the machine's firewall track. So for this machine, it'll be two 
Whereas for the fire guard, it would be three starting cost. Whichever kid invests the most time is the lead hacker, and they will take control of the machine if the attempt is successful. If there is a draw for this position, the first player will decide who becomes the lead hacker. Players will resolve the firewalls from left to right. If the spaces already have firewalls on them because a player scouted the machine earlier, then they will immediately resolve that particular firewall. Otherwise, they will draw one and place it on the first firewall. If the response card is currently in routine mode, check the top firewall. If it is an alert, check the bottom firewall. For now, it'll be in routine. Players can use a hack token to keep track of which firewall is currently being targeted. The color and symbol of the firewall indicates which action needs to be taken. The test is just like any other and the participating kids can help use items and combos. The test can be a single color as you see here, or can be two as you see here, and these must be completed from top to bottom. Some firewalls have special firewall effects, and we'll discuss those momentarily. If the kid successfully defeats the firewall, they move the hack token to the next space on the firewall track, and if that space is empty, draw a new firewall from the bowl and place it on the track. With a failed test, the machine's response card becomes alert and the hack token is moved to the lower half of the same firewall. The kid now has to take that test instead before they can continue and the hack token now stays on the alert side of the firewall track. If the machine is in alert mode and the kids have failed a hack attempt, check the response card to see what happens. The machine will react as if the kids had failed an avoid test. But this time, all characters who participate in a hack will be affected. Each participating kid must also move to an adjacent location, though the kids choose on their own and may move to different adjacent locations. If possible, though, the location they move to must be an open location. Then take the hack token and place it on the response card. This will indicate that the machine will not go back to routine at the start of the next round. Let's talk about the three firewall special effects. This effect right here is a repel attempt. This triggers the avoid response from the machine. Players will treat it as a regular avoid check. That means that in this case, nothing would happen. Or in this case, they would have to resolve one of these tests. This effect is the default firewall. This triggers the machine's default firewall found here. And this is an alert. The machine immediately becomes alert when reaching that firewall. The player then must resolve this firewall and then continue down the track on the alert side. Sometimes during a hack, an effect might cause the machine to move away. In this case, the hacking attempt immediately fails and is cut short. However, the kids do not suffer the effect of failure specified on the machine's response card, and they stay in their current location. After successfully hacking the machine, the kid with the most invested time becomes the hacker who controls it. Immediately move the machine onto the same location as the kids. It will now go with that kid using locations instead of grid sectors. The hacker can only control one machine at a time and may use its combo freely when taking a test, or can take the machine ride movement action. Some machines even have an ability that can be used as an action by spending time. Now let's discuss the two special actions the kids can use. For one time, a kid can rest. Resting allows them to immediately relieve one condition. If they are injured, resting can allow them to move the injured cube down one space. A relieved condition is placed in the action space. If a kid is already in their home section, which J is Sasha's home section, then it costs zero time for them to be home for dinner. If they are in any open location, it will cost them one time to go all the way home for dinner. If they are in a restricted location, it will cost two time for them to go home for dinner. If players cannot pay the necessary time to get home, they instead will be late. When a kid does make it home for dinner, 
place them lying down to indicate they are done with their turn for the round. From this point forward, the kid cannot help or participate in further actions this round. If the player does not have enough time to make it home, leave them standing up at their current location. They will still be able to help with tests at that location. A kid in their home section can choose not to go home for dinner if they want. Also, if a kid is controlling a hacked machine, it will cost them one less time to get home. Once the adventure phase is over, the first player verifies that the following steps are resolved. And then once that is done, the first player token will move to the next player to the left. All kids must discard down to four item cards, including their iconic item. The iconic item may not be discarded. If a kid did make it home for dinner, they gain one favor by moving this token to the left. If they were grounded previously, they now are not grounded. If the kid did not make it home for dinner, they move the token one step to the right. And if this means they are now on the frowny face, they have become grounded and lock two time tokens. Kids may never move time tokens from conditions into the grounded space. Whether or not a kid made it home for dinner, they will move an injured token one step to the right. If this causes it to leave the injured box, it goes into the action space. Kids should check at this point to see if they have successfully completed their chore. If they have, then they immediately get the reward or they can wait and turn the chore in at a later time, even later during a turn. But they cannot turn in after the chore deadline, which is marked on the weekly schedule. The first chore a player receives must be completed by the end of Friday on the weekly schedule of the first week, and the second chore must be completed by Thursday of the second week. If the chore is not completed, the player will resolve the failure condition. Double check to see if any diary cards currently in play refer to cleanup or end phase. Those texts will trigger at this point. And then after that, a new round begins as the players start a new day. And that is how you play Tales from the Loop, the board game. Be sure to come back to the channel, check out all of our other instructional videos. We're gonna be finishing up our instructional series for Nemesis Lockdown. We've got an instructional series for Streets coming up, Australia, uh, Nemo's War, lots of fantastic stuff coming up. So be sure to subscribe and click the bell and check back. And until next time, if you're bored online, bored offline.